everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. We're excited to continue our series of ACL year-round mentorship sessions. The mentorship aims to answer everyone's questions on different types of, uh, like, uh, on different type of uh, things that related to being an NLP researcher and growing with the community. So I'm very excited to be here today, joined by three wonderful panelists. Um, I am Zijing Jing, uh, the co-organizer. I am a PhD at Max Planck Institute in Germany and ETH in Switzerland. Uh, I work on NLP and causality. So together, this ACL mentorship is organized with uh, Mohit uh, Radha Mihachia, Mohit Bensal, Vinod Kumar Papakaran, uh, Ashkan Kazemi, and Lisa Bauer. Um, and today, very nice, we have three uh, panelists uh, who are Priyanka, uh, who is an ML manager at Booking.com, Booking Scott Hale, a uh, professor at Oxford, director of Research Medan, um, and so many different uh, titles, and Elisa, uh, who is a research scientist and a bridge. Um, so we're welcoming a very diverse set of opinions. and. Uh, today's topic will be finding an internship in NLP. Uh, so maybe we start from uh, Elisa, if you have any thoughts. We start with an intro and some basic opinions on this issue. So um, thanks for the introduction. So you guys already know I'm a research scientist at Abridge. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about my experience um, ha as having internships. So. When I started my PhD, I knew from the get go that I wanted to go <clears throat> into industry versus academia. And so that definitely uh, shaped my, my direction of um, what kinds of internships I was looking for. Um, so the, my first two years of the PhD, I just uh, did research with my advisor over the summer, trying to figure out uh, what it is that I wanted to do. And then in my third year, that's when I started uh, looking for internships actively. Um, and so my first internship was at Google and I did have a contact. Uh, I graduated from UT Austin and a former professor of linguistics, he ended up going to Google. And so I reached out to him um, to see like, hey, can you um, get me, give me information about internships and stuff. Uh, and then um, the second internship was at uh, Salesforce. And so th those kind of, that's um, my experience with internships. Um, and I'll, I'll give you just one quick tidbit of, of information is uh, try to figure out what you wanna do with your internship before you even start, because that way you'll get the most out of it. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, and you have many rich internship experience to share with the audience. So looking forward to the discussions later. And we start with the alphabetical order. And Priyanka, feel free to uh, speak. Yeah, sure. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Priyanka. And uh, currently, I'm a senior machine learning scientist and an ML manager at Booking.com. Prior to that, I was with IBM Research Lab. And overall, it's been uh, nine plus years of experience uh, working with industrial groups, research groups. <clears throat> so um, my work is in the area of NLU, uh, National Language Understanding, working on problems of question answering, uh, cross-model retrieval, uh, semantic parsing, et cetera, and especially looking um, at them from low resource settings. Um, how do we uh, train these kind of models with limited supervision so as to be able to scale them to different languages and domains? And for me, uh, internships have been uh, really, uh, I think my involvement with internships has been many fold. So first it started with, um, I was a student, like undergrad student, and I was not sure whether I want to go into industry or go do like research, uh, research. So the first was an academic industry, uh, academic uh, internship, uh, where I got a good, like a quick preview into what research is, what does it mean to, what is a research problem in itself, and what does it mean to work on it, and uh, what kind of efforts are needed, uh, uh, right from learning about state of the art, 
implementing your thoughts, uh, comparing them, writing about them later on and so on. So I really found that very interesting and it gave me um, an insight into the research world and um, further on, um, I think, led me to pursue research. Then as a research student, again, I had this, um, I did not know whether to go further into academia or to go for industrial research. So I had the opportunity to do an industrial internship with IBM Research Lab and um, that was quite a rewarding experience as well because again um you you get this um you get an idea about what that particular workplace is and overall what industrial research is because as a student um it's it's not as collaborative at times or it is uh, uh depending on where you are doing your uh you are a student uh, but sometimes it is far from the real world so it gives a good um hand about hang about the data sets there and the kind of problems and uh, also it led me to my, um, at that point, like the first first of the paper um, out of the internship and also pre-placement offer. So I think overall uh, internships, uh, doing internships can be really an excellent opportunity to get a bit of diversified learning. And also um, if you are able to find the, uh, able to find an internship into the place you are looking forward to join to, then it can be a good experience to learn about uh, that workplace and that and that kind of workplace, whether you're interested in that or not, or, or you want to do something else. After that, I've also been a uh, mentor myself, um, uh, mentoring multiple students, uh, uh, and I can also share some information there. And then I've also been internship coordinator. So I was an internship coordinator for IBM Research Lab in India. And um, even at Booking.com, I'm helping um, uh, Booking.com to have their first, very first internship, PhD internship program. Uh, so yes, you can also, uh, I mean, I've also been sort of like an ambassador for internships. I strongly believe in them. So happy to share uh, my thought, thoughts and discuss uh, if you are looking for internships and how can you find the right one. And uh, yes, thanks for having me here. Great, thank you for the very practical help. <laughs> Oh, and now let's go to Scott. Thanks. It's great to be here. Really looking forward. I already see some some questions popping up, but um, I'll back up and at least just say a little bit about my background. So I'm still undecided, uh, if you like, between industry and, and academia. Um, I feel quite fortunate that I actually have a split role. So I spend half my time uh, as an associate professor at the University of Oxford uh, and the other half uh, as director of research at a nonprofit called Medan. And Medan is building open source software, uh, developing tools for fact checkers and journalists. Um, and so uh, it's sort of it's nice to be able to see these two sides. Um, and yeah, I, I absolutely I think it's great. Uh, you know, if you have that opportunity through the, the PhD to sort of see what it looks like on the industry side as well, I think there's a lot of uh, good differences, you know, both, both directions, right? But um, time scales are different, the, the objectives are different, um, and it's, but on the other hand, I think it can also be quite complementary to one another. And I've certainly enjoyed being able to sort of, you know, maybe explore things a bit deeper, less time pressure on, on the academic side, but also, you know, really being able to see tangible uh, results and, and getting things out shipped to real users, right, um, on, on the industry, quote unquote, side. Um, although Medan is, is a nonprofit, so I guess I'll speak a little bit maybe um, about that as well. So I've hosted, you know, academic visitors, um, but I've also um, hosted uh, interns at at me down and I guess with a nonprofit the the challenge may be slightly different from some of the larger industry players is the funding sort of landscape is always evolving um, as the budget goes on so usually there's a base level probably we know we can at least you know uh, do this amount of, of internships in the summer or something but um, you know sometimes it becomes a, a new funder comes through or something and all of a sudden oh, there's going to be a new opportunity and so there's I would say it's a little bit more flexible um, or, <laughs> or it can sometimes be a little bit last minute. So it's always worth um, sort of checking in and, and just, you know, I think the more that you can identify why you want to do an internship and why a particular organization is, is of interest, um, then, you know, you can just sort of keep in touch, um, maybe whether it's with the internship coordinator program and something that's more formal or someone like me in a director of research role. Um, 
And, you know, if, even if there's not an opportunity um, in the initial case, there might develop uh, to be an opportunity. Uh, at least that's certainly been my experience with, with the nonprofit side um, of things. And, yeah, I, I think, um, well, we'll probably we'll get into the, um, uh, in, into the questions and such, but I think there's a lot of great questions here. Um, around yeah <laughs> how to how to demonstrate the skills and how to demonstrate the fit and to me that's the that's the part that i think is um is helpful especially in smaller organizations like me and is it's trying to just understand the the fit because of course as a as someone hosting an internship there's a coordination cost uh to that as well you know the one had be great just be like yeah everyone come on we'll have all this all this you know projects all these things happening but of course each person coming in has a coordination cost to get them up to speed and um sort of integrated into the team etc and so i think as a someone hosting interns the the question i'm always asking myself is just trying to to balance right this um idea of, of understanding what's the skill set um and you know what could feasibly be accomplished in the time uh that's being proposed as an intern for instance and then weighing that up against the um the sort of coordination costs and in other aspects um, but i'll look forward to, to diving into the, the questions uh, a bit later in the moment just want to leave that as an intro and um and so yeah really great to have everyone here wonderful thank you scott for the very detailed and also rich sharing so on um, today's panel now we see different like uh, uh, people with experience on different sizes of, of companies, different natures of company from nonprofit to profit, and like each company that you have experience with also serve different social functions. Um, and also in terms of personal experience, there are there can potentially be sharings about internship versus full time versus being a professor 50% academia and 50% with the company and also a, a wide range of geolocations. So I guess we will go like this. Um, so in the previous sessions, we always go from the most voted one uh, and then later on. Uh, so when I open the slide and, but like so, sort of like inspired by Scott's uh, talk, I also would like to maybe each mentor, you can also pick a question, pick a topic. And then like you be the first person talking about that. So I start with the most voted one. And then later on, like maybe also in the order that we introduce ourselves, each mentor pick up a question and then the others follow that to answer. So the most voted one so far is, uh, dear mentors, I want a very practical one. I want to know if I need to publish at least one first author paper to get accepted for an NLP internship. Or like more generally, like what do hires really look into? So. Yeah, feel free to speak up. Yeah. Yeah, I can. Um, uh, yeah, I can pick that up one. So I think um, <clears throat> uh, Scott sort of uh, on a cursory manner mentioned it. So what we are like really looking for when we have a student joining is uh, really the fit. And uh, what that means is, see, especially the internships are usually typically three months long or six months long, uh, depending on where you are interning. And we are looking for a very, uh, typically the mentors are looking for a very focused problem or a focused topic or a focused area that they want to uh, delve into with the help of the intern. So the most important thing uh, is really the fit or the interest of the student, um, any kind of past experience that's been relevant and so on. So really uh, just having a first author paper uh, where it could be in a completely uh, or a slightly different uh, problem setting or a slightly different topic, rather than that, if the person has really worked on a certain topic or has expressed uh, the right interest or the right passion for it, then I think that's going to be more uh, make more of a difference rather than just going for the or believing that first author paper or the or one paper is going to be the to going to be the filtering um, criteria. So I think no mentor really looks for whether or is going to um, threshold that I'm going to consider only a student who has had a paper. So please don't, uh, I would suggest, please don't think about it like that. 
um so first thing is the alignment uh with the with just the area or the interest second thing i think like i am assuming what the person or the people who are posting this question mean is that how can they showcase their profile the best is paper the only way or are they, there are other venues to do it for example you could have done a a GitLab, uh, a Git repository, you can um, showcase some of the projects that you have done there. So that's one way to uh, bring forward what you're interested in. And also you can sometimes, um, the applications are paired with um, writing about or writing a paragraph of why you're interested. I think that's where, again, you can um, show what your interests are. And another way to do it is by just reaching out uh, the mentors or people whom you know directly. So, for example, what Elisa mentioned, uh, you can uh, you might be like meeting a lot of people due, at conferences or just reading about different uh, uh, work from different groups or different labs or different people. So feel free to reach out to them, write to them, and uh, uh, you would be surprised how responsive responsive sometimes people are. And it could also be a yeah, it could also be that sometimes you're writing like multiple emails, but there is no response, but don't, uh, do not take it on like really your profile. Like as far as there is a match, I'm sure uh, you would have the person reach out to it, to you. So just, I think increasing your visibility through these other mechanisms is also an option. So just a practical um, advice, I think on this is please do not constrain yourself with um, a paper as a criteria. Look at other venues where you can uh, put forward your profile better. I really yeah. agree with that uh, in my experience as well. You know, I think there's there's a lot of ways to to sort of communicate and show the skills that you have, and a paper may be one of those. Um, but sometimes also, you know, if there's a lot of authors on that paper, it's sometimes, well, what exactly was the skill that you had, you know, in in the paper, et cetera. And, and yeah, a GitHub repository um, showing that you you know, demonstrating some piece of code. I've hired someone um, who had just a really good blog, you know, couple blog posts, two, three blog posts that were walking through um, a particular technology. In fact, well, one recent one was, um, uh, this was hired on the ac academic side, but, um, you know, they just had a, a post explaining, hey, how I use Docker to do, re you know, reproducible social science. And so there wasn't any big new technical, um, advanced there but it was a really you know showed a really good understanding of sort of best practices and creating you know reproducible environments obviously a clear knowledge of, of you know this person having learned docker and you know it was sort of a skill set because i knew hey actually on the academic side i needed to hire somebody to help out um with this project where we're going to have a lot of uh, docker uh, components, etc. And you know what, they were, you know, clearly had had knowledge and, and we're going to fit into that, that sort of role. And so I think there's lots of different ways you can can showcase um, those skills. And yeah, I, I would also echo this idea of just reaching out. Um, there's a, another question down here of, of how to reach out if you don't have a prior interaction. So I, you know, I think it's come up before it's like, okay, well, you know, check your your network, um, you might be surprised, you know, who who is already connected with somebody or, or alumni of your institution, um, professors who, who may have connections, and, and they may be able to, to sort of at least get you an introduction to, um, to get further information or point you in the right direction. But that shouldn't stop you either. Um, you know, I think it's perfectly fine to sort of just reach out um to you know to someone in industry or in academia who you identified as you know a good a good fit i think what helps is again trying to show why you think it's a good fit where you think there is alignment um and so if you reach out with the generic i'm looking for internships here's my cv right you're, you're putting the burden um on the receiver to try to figure out well okay what are the key skills they have do those match a problem um, that I have is there is there something here um, whereas you know if you can reach out and say well look I've, I've looked into the work that this organization's doing um, I have this skill which I think could contribute in this way even if in the end that doesn't end up being the um, the most pressing or the thing that the internship ends up being based on it shows initiative it shows that you're you're already thinking about you know why that company or organization um, and you know particular skills that you have and i think that sort of 
um, ability just to demonstrate that you can think through those connections is really helpful. Yeah, so I'll, I'll echo what um, Scott and Priyanka said. The answer is no. Um, as being on the hiring side, uh, that's definitely not a requirement for us at a bridge. Uh, we have hired even undergrads. Uh, it just depends, like, is it a good fit for the work that we want? If we have something in mind. Um, and I'll, I'll tell a story as when I was a PhD student, uh, this was towards the end of my second year, where I ended up not doing an internship, but about the end of my second year, I was like, oh, maybe I should do an internship. And I kind of scrambled. Um, I just read someone's thesis as part of um, some research I was doing. And I realized, I Googled this guy's name, and I was like, realized, oh, he's like the head of research at, the, at this other company. Um, let me just like email him out of the blue and say, you know, I just read your dissertation. Uh, I, I really wanna like, I wanna use that part of the dissertation for this specific project that I'm working on. And hey, by the way, do you have any internship positions open? And, and so he replied, which was shocking, you know, this guy didn't know who I was. Um, but um, so we, I almost got an internship out of that. If I had like emailed him much earlier, but because it was so late in the process, they had already finished their hiring. So he, he actually tried to get me hired, but it just didn't work out. Um, but even, even though I didn't get an internship out of that, now he knew who I was. And then at the next uh, CL conference that we went to, uh, I got to meet him in person. And now, and now I was able to expand my network. So even a rejection is good. So I definitely try to reach out and with those very specific uh, um, requests. It's such a good example of like being bold reach out and um, I also really like uh, Priyanka and Scott's sharing, uh, especially the caring about the duct product and also there's a diversity of ways that we can demonstrate our skills. Um, cool. Uh, Elisa, do you prefer us to go through the second popular question or like would you like to pick a question that you like uh, from Slido? Let's do the, the second most popular because it seems to have quite a bit of votes. All right, let's That's see. Great. Yeah, so uh, to I give guess. a more tangible, oh, okay. Um, to, to give a more tangible picture of what actual qualifications are needed, can mentors share some examples of previous interns they accepted? Like to the extent of like, it's, it can be like sort of general description. So I, I guess I can start, and I think I did, I shared a little bit, but not maybe not as much. Um, so I, I, when I did my first internship, I think I only had maybe two published papers. I mean, I don't have a lot of published papers in, at all, actually. Um, so, so that kind of backs up the question of like, do you need first author published papers? The answer is no. Um, but I had, um, I had extensive experience as a software developer because be before I started my PhD, I was actually a developer for almost like 10 years plus. Um, and so I definitely framed um, my resume to, to highlight that um, so that they would know that I can get up to speed up and running pretty quickly. Um, so even though, even if I didn't have like a huge amount of papers published, I do have this, uh, I was able to highlight my strengths. Um, and I think the other thing that helped was uh, having somebody in the network that could vouch for you. And so that was the case with Google. I had this ex-professor who was now part of Google research who was able to vouch for me. Um, so if you can get somebody um, in your network at the company, then I think that also helps Yeah, I can also add to that. Uh, so uh, being like a part of also conducting the internship process and being a mentor, I think uh, not all the internships are the same. So even within a given research lab, 
uh, when uh, the team, like I do not know the, the demographic of the students here, but I'm assuming there would be students who are undergrad or some would be masters and some would be in their PhD right now. So um, the same lab or the same institute can have internships for different kinds of students. And it might not be, be like uh, just upfront mentioned, but usually if you go to the qualifications, you'll write, you'll see like bachelor's, undergrad, un, uh, bachelor's, master's or PhD, preferable, things like that. And as far as there is relevant experience preferable, uh, do I think do count yourself uh, in if you have that kind of experience. So do not constrain yourself by thinking that, oh, if it is a uh, Google research or if it is a Microsoft research or, or a certain institute, it would only be preferring uh, PhD students because from the mentor's perspective, what happens is the projects are in different stages. Uh, sometimes it could be at a very initial stage where they're looking for, they have a problem or a topic in mind uh, but you do not know what approach to go for, what uh, really to work on. So maybe at that point, maybe a PhD student comes really uh, as a good collaborator. But there are instances when uh, there is a minimal uh, POC done or there are some ideas on the platform, but you, you really need somebody to code it out and to just test them out, do the ablations and so on. And uh, at that time, maybe a person who's a really good uh, coder or an implementer, which at times are also undergrad students. So I myself had an intern like early on who was an undergrad student who helped us in uh, doing a lot of these uh, things that he was sort of like the first author of the paper that we eventually uh, wrote out of the internship. So uh, do not, I think, restrict yourself on uh, whether you have a paper or whether you have a good, uh, uh, say a blog or not. So I think look at what are your strengths, first of all. Um, are you more comfortable by taking a problem end to end? Or are you more comfortable with you are given a problem or an approach and then implementing it or thinking, taking it further, um, extending it on real world data sets, uh, much more larger scale implementations and so on. So know your strengths and um, that would also help in aligning you to the right project, what you're uh, planning to gain out of it. So whichever place you are in or whichever portfolio that you're building, try to showcase your strength out. So like I mentioned earlier, you could have a GitLab repository to, uh, to mention it, or you could have a blog post, some medium blogs, uh, which shows your extent of understanding of something that already exists. So it need not be new, but it's just that you have good fundamental understanding about the topic. So you can use those as tools. The second thing, uh, is about the network. Uh, so why is network important, right? Like there are these application portals where you uh, apply, but what just happens is there are like almost thousands of applications that come in. And sometimes it's not easy to filter them fairly, uh, especially given the people who are filtering it, there's no automation done yet. So it is done by people and uh, uh, they are looking for uh, those cues to understand whether this this would be the right person and if they so the process is that you have applications go go in and then the mentors or the committee filters down and then they conduct interviews with a selective set of students. So the second thing is to just uh, I think try to see if you uh, can uh, can know somebody or not really know but if you if you are aware that these are the problems and maybe have connected with the person during a conference or just written to them about their uh, work that I, re I really found it very interesting I had these thoughts follow-up thoughts on this what are your and if there are interviews available uh, you can also ask those things like what Elisa mentioned so that's one second thing third thing is also being timely because internships actually open much earlier than maybe what you start planning early early for it so that's also third thing which is very important because uh, most of the internships are sort of like closed by now so uh, typically the internship period for an industry lab is uh, the applications open up around october or november or maybe even earlier and much earlier people do have again uh, other candidates or students reaching out to them so just be timely, I think, be more active because maybe by the time you're planning for the next summer, uh, it, it might just be delayed. So I think that's the third more important thing. Academic internships are another um, good avenues and they, are, they can also be a bit more longer term. So yes, then there, I think connecting with the prof is uh, really important. So I would say, yeah, these three things uh, are some things to keep in mind, which would make your profile stand um, or make your strengths stand out a bit more. 
I think all of those have been really good suggestions. I don't know. I have a huge amount um, to add or not. But again, I, I think it's just worth highlighting the diversity of projects that can be undertaken as interns um, and, you know, being able to, to communicate. Well, think about where your strengths lie and then and be able to communicate those strengths. And so, yeah, if it's something that's much more at the basic research side, uh, you know, we're just formulating the problem, right? That's going to call for a different set of skills than maybe something where, hey, look, there's an established method uh, over here. We want to see, will that transfer to a new problem space? Um, and, you know, maybe this is going to be more applied. How well does it perform? Um, you know, what are the uh, understanding the, the sort of ablation studies and um, in sort of other details of, of you know, sort of investigating the errors that a classifier is making or or whatever in real use. Um, there's also, of course, a whole bunch of um, areas that for me are, are really exciting. So a lot of my work is more applied NLP, human in the loop um, type things where, um, yeah, you know, they're, they're, they're basic questions to be answered, but you almost have to answer them in a practical question, uh, practical way if it's a human in the loop problem sometimes. And so it's like, oh yeah, we're, we have this set up in the loop. We want to, you know, maybe try a new, um, a new way to, to sample items uh, for the pipeline or whatever. And so, um, again, it, you know, I think thinking about where your strengths um, and uh, one of the panelists mentioned, you know, having the background that was it you, uh, Alyssa, already as a developer prior to doing the PhD, right? So like that, that could be a huge strength, uh, depending on what the problem is. Or, okay, I know this literature really well in, in the sort of so you are in this area or look, yes, I have, you know, this skill set and uh, real familiarity, familiarity uh, with this type of problem. Even um, language problems can be, you know, just not human language competencies can be really helpful. Um, you know, uh, me, Dan, we're a, a global organization. We have um, six fact checking organizations in India um, working to our software and like so being able to better support Indian languages is a uh, is a big priority, and it's it's something that actually a former intern uh, at Medan made a lot of progress on being able to to train a better model uh, to do semantic similarity for um, for more Indian languages than we otherwise could uh, prior. And so, you know, I think being able to to understand the type of problem you want to contribute to, and um, and then being able to you know say why and, and why you think you can can contribute to that area can be really helpful. This is super good advice. Like I really like the point of like each project might have different needs. Like it can be like building models, but more over that it can also be like uh as Scott mentioned, like familiarity with this domain that's super important. And I like the point of knowing a low resource language. That's definitely a big add-on. Because maybe all the other teammates are mainly like English speakers and so on. And then you'll be like sort of the pool in the team. Um, yeah, I guess there might also be a lot of data set design or user like making the thing more custom for different users and so on. Great. Uh, awesome. Uh, so we have answered two questions so far and um, Scott, Priyanka, and Elisa, are there any questions that you want to like pick out that are like sort of you identify them as interesting and meaningful? Um, or feel free to type in the chat when you come up with that question. Um, then I'll still follow the original order. Um, I guess we had some little discussions over uh, how Oh, but how to, maybe this is also really meaningful. So as we mentioned that the network is important and then the student asks how to approach professors so that they can recommend you to internships. Oh, one second. Okay, this question is framed as for internships in academia, how to approach professors given that they don't have prior interactions. Yeah. I don't think it's hugely different from everything we've we've been saying in a way, um, yeah. right? It's it's about demonstrating that that your interests, your skill set, really connect with something that that professor is working on, just in the same way it is in, in connecting, you know, with a, a problem maybe that an industry organization is facing. 
Um, and yeah, I think that's, um, you know, so, so being able to look at the research that's coming out, um, obviously research though, of course, what the time it comes out of peer, peer publication is already some delay from when it was being conducted. So, you know, maybe check out on um, blog posts or Twitter if there's um, anything there as well that might give you an idea of what, um, what current work is happening. You might be able to reach out to a student, um, you know, as so one of their current PhD students as well, um, often is a good way to, to sort of say, hey, I want to learn a little bit more about the work in that lab, um, etc. And then, um, you know, you hopefully can craft a, a better email, um, a better start of, of, you know, why you're reaching out um, and, and explain what it is really about their work that um, that is motivating you to, uh, to reach out and, and what you'd hope to, uh, to do. This is probably unlikely, but if that professor happens to be at your same university, then take one of their courses for sure. Because then, then they'll know you and they'll know your work. Um, and you can also ask your advisor to send an email like, hey, here's my student. He or she is interested in this area. And, you know, and then that can also be another way to not even just to, to start a collaboration. Yeah, I think that's also true. It's like you don't have to reach out necessarily for, oh, I want an internship, uh, you know, this summer right away. It's more, you know, ideally, if you know, you're interested in their work, it's sort of like, hey, I'm really interested in this. I want to learn more. Maybe there's a collaboration opportunity, um, et cetera, right? And it, it might not be. Um, like, you know, you can say, well, if there are internships, obviously I'm, I'm interested in that, but, um, you know, if you're open to a range of, of ways of keeping in touch on that topic or potentially collaborating, that gives the professor probably a little bit more, um, more space. Again, you know, I alluded to this on the nonprofit side that funding landscapes are, are shifting. I think that's also true, um, in academia. And so, you know, exactly how much, uh, money may be available for interns this summer um, probably varies from one year to the next more so than it does in, in sort of industry. Yeah, and I think in addition to like sending emails through you or like through a common, like through an advisor or through a common network uh, entity, another option is to also uh, maybe if you and the professor is at a common event, um, earlier, especially it was easier pre-COVID time, like if you are uh, at a conference or at a workshop where you happen to come across a professor, feel free to like reach out to them, uh, talk about your work. Uh, they will be more than happy to, to discuss if you have some ideas on their work or some opinion, I think they would be happy to discuss and uh, you can that can be a good way to start a mail chain or a way to connect with them and then over time you can also try to see if you are interested and reach out. So I think even if you have not thought about interning with them, you can just keep this as a cue to like, just uh, be connected. And then at some point when you are looking for an internship, you can reach out to them. Yeah, these are very good, uh, good suggestions. So uh, now let's uh, proceed to the other questions. Some of the questions have already been tackled, like uh, not necessarily having a top tier, uh, publication and then like we can still get our foot into the door by looking into our uh, own skill sets and for the other things can be uh, could you talk a little bit about potential NLP internships at nonprofits or NGOs I guess it could also be generalized as like I feel like different teams serve for different social purposes there are like even nonprofits serving for different goals or even within the same company, uh, there can be different functions that people pay attention to and like sort of the how sustainable that team is like um, in an ecosystem. So feel free to uh, yeah, speak out. Because I could say something about um, being director of research at a nonprofit. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess it does vary quite incredibly depending on the the nonprofit, I mean, uh, Medan is relatively small. Let's say thirty people, um, right? And so, you know, we bring on maybe you know one or two interns, and, and you know already that's a lot for for the size of the organization. You, know, you get the sense that it's just a um, 
a smaller group to begin with, whereas, you know, maybe a very large NGO would, would have a different approach uh, to this. So I think probably there's, there's a lot in, in that way. Um, I've mentioned the funding sort of landscape a bit uh, changing over time. Um, and yeah, I, I think again, it, it's not terribly different from the other things we've been saying um, in general in terms of finding internships, of, of identifying the opportunity, keeping in touch, you know, maybe especially with NGOs, I think, um, thinking about, well, what what opportunities are there for collaboration that may be an internship, there may be um, other opportunities, uh, uh, you know, that aren't a full internship, but, uh, you know, maybe are a good way to start to keep in touch, make, you know, make the decision makers aware of the research uh, that you're doing, et cetera, right? Um, and yeah, I think, you know, in general, I guess um, the opportunity with with nonprofits, NGOs, is that they tend to be very mission focused. Certainly that's the case at, at Mitan. It's like, we want a more equitable internet. That's our guiding mission statement. And we want to work uh, to build the technology and, and build the partnerships with fact checkers, journalists, and others to, uh, to sort of envision that. So I think it can be exciting um, to, to have that sort of real focus on, hey, how do we um, improve the public good, which is, you know, quite a lofty thing on the one hand, um, but also I can find uh, can, can be quite energizing and exciting. Um, of course, you know, there's lots of mission driven uh, work happening in, in industry as well. And um, yeah, I'm happy for the other panelists to, to comment too. Yeah, I think while I cannot uh, comment on the NGO part, uh, like exactly, like maybe I think it was quite insightful what, what uh, Scott shared, but I think uh, in a way it's good to be open to a little bit of uncertainty, like once you have been accepted into an internship program, because um, not everything is completely pre-planned all the time. So one way to mitigate that is by connecting your uh, with your mentors uh, even before the internship starts and sort of uh, starting a conversation on the topic and uh, detailing if, if the time allows both for you and the mentor. So I think that's one way to reduce the uncertainty or have like an accelerated progress both before the after and as well as, a, as uh, like before and after the internship, you can do that. I think one of the questions that's, uh, uh, again, like the top rated question is uh, internships between academia versus industry. So uh, if there is an option to do among the two, um, I think it really uh, is depending, like going back to uh, what we started with, like what's the purpose of the internship? Uh, one could be just to learn about uh, or to dive deeper into a certain area and say if there are multiple opportunities that give you that. Um, another could be that you are exploring um, these as further opportunities, like one could be you want to pursue a career further in academia, then definitely I think academic internship uh, is better, or uh, it could be your, you want to improve your publication profile. Um, in that case, you need to judge which, which one to go for, uh, or it could be that you are looking for an industrial position later on, then the industrial internship works better. So it really depends on what you're planning to gain out of uh, it. Sometimes it's very clear, like you are looking for industrial and in, in a career further in one of the two, then it's, I think, quite crystal clear. If there is um, a middle ground, like you think there is an area which is which can be supported by either of the workplaces or either of the, uh, the streams, or you are planning to just improve, um, to learn more about how to do research in itself, uh, so in that case, uh, I think if you are like, if you want to do research uh, better and like have more focused research, maybe academic internship uh, would work better. But before you make any decision, I think it's best to talk to the respective mentors or the professors who are, uh, who are uh, giving out that internship, because even in academia, the professors usually have a project in mind and they know uh, it's not necessary that all the academic internships are necessarily very research focused. It could be more about establishing, say, for a low resource languages, uh, establishing a data set, a benchmarking toolkit, and so on. So, so there there could be different kind of uh, uh, different kind of uh, uh, 
um, aims or goals of a certain internship. So do try to have an interaction a priori with these if there are multiple um, opportunities available before you make a call because there's not i think especially in today's time there's not a crystal clear definition on what an industry research uh, industry research internship is versus an academic internship is so be very open minded talk to the uh, talk to the mentors or the professors and get gain an understanding on which one would suit you better uh, i'll definitely um, agree with priyanka and that last bit that you said between that there's the line are getting blurred between academic internships and industry internships. Um, a lot of professors are like taking sabbaticals to go um, do some research at companies. Um, so when I did my internship at Google, I was working with a Google employee, but I also had the chance to co collaborate with two professors who were on like this kind of leave of absence from their academic job. Um, of course, I think Scott is also a good example of like doing living in both worlds. So, so I think um, there's less of a distinction now. So you you do have the chance of working with both if you wanted to. I think with this, I'm sorry. I think what this question hints at as well that that maybe is an interesting point to pivot towards is how do you select an internship? Which I would sort of um, suggest that one thing at least to think about is what do you want out of the internship, right? Um, is it to build a particular skill set and be able to, to showcase that, right? And then, you know, maybe that it's at different points in that pipeline, but you can think about, okay, I really going to dive into to this method and, and learn this area. Um, you know, is it around um, actual sort of development skills? Maybe it's not I'm learning new science, but I'm I'm gonna learn how to make this practical, and I want to be able to show show the impact and and sort of develop um you know develop some of the software engineering skills that maybe complement uh, what I'm doing in the research. Um, do I need to have a publication out at the end of this? Um, you know, if my goal is to go to to academia, then you know having a publication certainly helps maybe in the next uh, job search in, in academia. But if I'm going to industry, you know, maybe actually just having the internship and being able to point towards developed software uh, is really important. Being able to ask as well whether the outputs of what you're doing are going to be public or they're all going to be NDA'd and, and confidential, uh, right, can again be be helpful. Obviously, this is something always being navigated in uh, in industry hiring, uh, where maybe people can't entirely say what they're, um, you know, all the details of what they've worked on in, in confidential projects. But you know, there's a lot of open um, project development that happens in industry, certainly uh, in nonprofit as well. Me, Dan, for instance, all the codes open source. So it's sort of like, yeah, you had a point to it. You could show the Git commits that you've made uh, into the live software. Uh, project, etc. Um, Google Summer of Code, of course, is an example of this as well, where the, the whole goal is to sort of contribute to open source uh, software projects and be able to use that to, to build. And so I think, you know, where you're at um, and what your goals are in terms of where you see yourself longer term, industry versus um, academia can help also shape uh, some of the the opportunities and maybe help you sort of figure out what sort of um, internship would be the best for for where you're at currently and that can change over time of course as well if you're right at the beginning maybe you just want to get some industry experience and just you know see what it's like uh, without a, a real focus on what the output is whereas once you're a little bit more advanced in in the degree program if you know where you're going then you might have in, in mind a particular output um, that you hope you could could work on and develop through the internship three suggestions um like I, I really agree with the point that like we first need to define what we want and then like navigate through the diverse choices and uh also from the chat and also from the slido questions i saw that a lot of uh, some people are PhDs, and then there are also many who are first year master's students or undergrads. I feel like the suggestions tailored towards them can also be like more specific, especially let's say in the case of uh, undergrads, at least many undergrads I met, like they also want to open the opportunity 
because they, they still don't know whether they want to apply for masters, PhDs, or directly go to industry. So maybe for undecided cases um, and still navigating, like, uh, should people aim for uh, famous names? Should people aim for like going to their local professor's lab or like, I guess it might be really confusing for people who are just starting to NLP. Yeah, I think I for can... the, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Okay, um, I'll go. <laughs> so I was gonna say, I'll just say my experience as an undergrad, what I did was I went to all of the professors um in my department i went to their office hours to talk about their research just like you know have a chat with them and and they were so happy to have somebody to talk to about their research um so so definitely don't hesitate to to go and talk to people to professors even if you think like oh they might be busy but but they're always happy to talk to you about their research you know because that's their baby um and then and then you can also ask, you know, like, do you have openings? And and that can be a way to to um, start some undergraduate research collaborations. Um, so there, there, I would say, if you're at your local university is probably the the easiest way to to get some experience under your belt with research. Yes, and to add to it, I guess also, so the one is to understand what the research internship is. And uh, so I think a safer option, like in that case becomes, uh, is to sort of do an academic internship, because um, I think in industry internship, there could be many things like uh, you do not know, uh, sometimes a priori, especially if you're an undergrad uh, intern, which team you would be doing. There's a more of a likelihood uh, if you are applying under normal Google, like say versus Google research or in any company uh, to an internship versus a research lab um, of uh, being into a developer internship. So first thing, uh, when you are getting an internship, especially from an industry, um, you have to be careful that it is, uh, and you are interested in exploring the research options there, then you have to be careful about whether it's a research internship or not. Um, the second thing could be, uh, so in that case, academic is an um, easier one or a safer bet. The second thing could be that it's just about exposure to NLP and not even about research or not research. You're just interested in knowing whether it's uh, an NLP, uh, what, what does NLP problem look like and what would it be? I think in that case, um, it is, again, it is like dependent on the group. So you can then talk about um, whether it is a university professor uh, or uh, the industrial um, uh, internship, uh, what kind of problem they would be working on. And again, uh, it might just so happen um, that uh, industry internships, they might tend to be a little bit more raw. <laughs> Uh, to like it, it, they might be just too crude to uh, because they would be working on a real problem and many times maybe you get stuck in the data part of it or really working on an in-depth NLP problem uh, with the focus it it is uh, it is dependent on the lab so you cannot say that every single uh, industry internship with sites NLP um, to it would actually have a considerable amount of NLP to it. So again, I think these are conversations to be cognizant about. You cannot like term it as an NLP internship or as a research internship uh, purely because of the way it's been said. So just try to get more details there. And if the goal is to also go further on for a master's or a PhD, um, apply for that, then you are also looking for accumulating more uh, to your like gathering more of uh, evidence in your portfolio so that you can communicate your profile better. So in that case, you can look for things like who the internship is with like maybe a recommendation from them because you're looking for a letter of recommendation for uh, from the advisor or the mentor. So you can look for like who would be the right person maybe who can give you the letter of recommendation once you've worked on. And then again, like, because of NDA, can you talk about it um, in detail with others? So you can look out for those things, especially if you're considering applying it, applying for a uh, for a position later. So I think as an undergrad student, um, it's just um, and it's, if you're new to the area and if you're new to research, just be very careful that the internship that you're choosing 
uh, actually has those components and not just at a very periphery because uh, there could uh, be a miscommunication there uh, non-deliberately as well. Cool, I agree with all that. I'll just, I wanna jump in just because I think there's some interesting questions that can probably be answered very quickly um, that are near the, the bottom of this, but um, maybe just to answer a few of these and, and anyone anyway, <laughs> who disagree, jump in. But there was a question about whether it's necessary to have a PhD or is a master's enough to get a job in industry? I think a master's is, is definitely enough um, there, right? And how does the name of the, the institution affect uh, internship selection? Look, it's one of those maybe signals that someone manually shifting, you know, sifting through applications at the beginning might look at, but much more important are other ways that you can demonstrate uh, the skills in, in selection. I'd rather take somebody who's clearly, you know, a good fit, has the relevant skills, can tell me how they have the relevant skills and why they want that internship, even if it's from a university name I don't recognize, uh, than it's somebody who sends me, you know, something generic from, uh, from a university, even if I say, oh, well, that's a nice university. I, you know, it's, I'm, I'm not hiring the university, I'm hiring the person. So um, at the end, and then um, there's one other one I thought that was, was very nice um, uh, here. But anyway, I'm, I'm losing that one on Slido now. So yeah, I think um, hopefully this has given a flavor of, of some of the different options and um, yeah, I think, you know, big thing is not to be discouraged, even if you send out uh, an application and, and don't hear back, um, it's probably nothing personal. <laughs> I'm I've, I've sometimes very bad on email myself. Uh, apologies to anyone who I haven't replied to. And it's, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, just being able to, to reach out to a number of people and, uh, and see where those conversations go is a great opportunity. Wonderful. Thank you, Scott, for ending with a nice overview of the rest of the questions. And I really like how our section goes. And also to the mentees, like the like our mentoring session is with limited time, but this session is to bring about a thinking framework in case you have new problems in the future as well. Then do like sort of the three steps, know what you want, make the right choice, like what internship to apply and then once you decide that then strive to get the right skill set 